Attention consumers, certain portable gaming systems are being dressed up in order to distract the buyer from their ordinary one-color play. What could be next? Little flower print dresses? Black leather restraining devices? Fresh baked olive loaf? Don't be fooled. Get Sega Game Gear. Basic black on the outside. Hundreds of exciting full-color games radiating from the inside. And we promise no sleazy little get-ups that scream, Hello, big boy. Get Game Gear. Sega! What do you think of when you think of Sega? Sonic? Streets of Rage? Maybe even arcade games? Well, their beginnings can trace back to 1940, under the name Standard Games. Two men, Martin Bromley and Irvin Bromberg, teamed together to provide amusement machines and slot machines to the US Army, as the current world war was creating quite a demand for non-wartime entertainment. When the war ended, Standard Games was sold and replaced with Service Games in 1946, named after the military, of course. It was based in Honolulu, Hawaii, but would soon move its operation to Japan to skirt around the 1951 law outlawing slot machines on army bases. The nickname Sega wouldn't appear until 1954 on a slot machine known as Diamond Star. Service games closed in 1960 after scrutiny from the US government, but the men didn't give up their dreams. Bromley established two businesses, Nihon Goraku Basan and Nihon Kikai Saizo. Kikai Saizo moved forward with slot machines while Goraku Basan worked on jukeboxes under Udomatic Inc. The two would eventually merge and maintain the Sega name, with the first product to carry it, the Sega 1000 Jukebox, released in 1960. Around the same time, David Rosen was stationed in Japan and had fallen in love with the country in return to start Rosen Enterprises in 1954, specializing in photo booths. Nihon Goraku Basan acquired Rosen Enterprises in 1965 and shifted into Sega Enterprises. Rosen was promoted to CEO, Richard Stewart as president, and Ray Lemaire as director of planning. This upgrade stopped their association with military bases and into coin-operated amusement machines like pinball games and jukeboxes. At first, they worked on second-hand machines, but they soon learned that they needed to develop their own games. The first EM arcade game they made was Periscope, a submarine simulator. It proved to be quite a success worldwide, paving the way for the standard 25 cents to play. The success surprised Sega, but it inspired them too, leading them to make around 8-10 to 10 games a year. They continued to export arcade games until 1970, when piracy became a huge problem. Rosen wanted to take Sega into the public eye, but was nervous about it. He got a foot in the door when Gulf and Western acquired Sega on May 3, 1969, allowing them to import American pinball tables and even the rights to Paramount Films. The first Sega arcades in the US popped up in 1974 in shopping malls throughout the states. I mean, it was a matter of time until they hopped into video games, right? They teamed up with Gremlin Industries and continued to skyrocket thanks to games like Frogger, Turbo, and Zaxxon. They were also the first to make the Eat the Dots concept in 1979 and head on. Namco would eventually use the idea to create Pac-Man. Financial troubles broke Sega's relationship with Gulf and Western, and they became a Japanese company for the second time in 1984 thanks to Rosen, Hayao Nakayama, and Isao Ogawa. With the craze of arcades declining in the early 80s, Sega made their first video game console, the SG-1000, and the microcomputer SC-3000 in June of 1983. The SG-1000 sold 160,000 units the year of its release, but soon lost to Nintendo's Famicom. This sparked the rivalry which continued on for years. The fight between them became obvious when the Game Gear stepped into the market to compete with the Game Boy on October 6, 1990. It was essentially an 8-bit, portable, and smaller version of their Master System, with a full-colored screen unlike the monochromatic Game Boy. It also competed with the Atari Lynx and NEC's Turbo Express, but none of those consoles including the Game Gear would surpass the Game Boy. Its faults, a short battery life, a small category of games, and not a lot of support from Sega. I believe that the Game Gear had potential that went unnoticed compared to the Game Boy, which is really unfortunate. The team may have also worked too quickly, not quite understanding the portable console market and focusing too much on their home consoles like the Sega Genesis and the Sega Saturn. This led to the Game Gear being discontinued in 1997, and no other portable consoles could really compare to it. Originally, there was a sequel to the Game Gear in development, though the name is unknown and information on it is very limited. This IGN article I found sums it up best, even though I wasn't able to locate a source, so please take this information with a grain of salt. The article says, Few people know about it, but there was another system being worked on at the time. Sega had taken a sizable chunk out of the Game Boy's market share. 
With the green screen handheld experiencing a lull, long before Pokémon arrived to save it, Sega had a golden opportunity to strike with a new handheld of their own. According to Kalinske, the system would have packed 16-bit graphics, a very high-quality, higher-resolution screen, and a touchscreen interface, years before the Nintendo DS or the TigerGame.com. Unfortunately, the spec was a dream at best. The system would have been prohibitively expensive, $289 by Kalinske's recollection. Sega chose to shelve the idea, leaving the Nomad, a handheld version of Genesis, as the Game Gear's only successor. Now that we have a history of Sega and the Game Gear out of the way, let's dive into a list of the Game Gear's lost games. Buckle up and grab a snack. This one is a doozy. Yohoden Hisumaro Bonton no Ken was a cancelled JRPG for the Game Gear set to release sometime in 1992 or 1993. Set in feudal Japan, the main character is able to transform into a Tengu, or a mischievous swordsman spirit from Japanese folklore. I was able to find a brief description of the game in a magazine, and it states, a field-type RPG set in medieval Japan. The protagonist, Hasui Maru, is suddenly struck by lightning and becomes a Tengu. Why was he transformed into this figure? Fate now waits for him. As you see from these images, it seems that popular figures of Japanese folklore and real-life history would have appeared in the game such as Momotaro, Kintaro, Ushiwakamaru, and Benke. Gameplay footage and screenshots do exist, but it's unknown why the game was cancelled and soon forgotten about. Was a game featuring an elephant trying to take his force back from an evil rhinoceros known as Rhinus Pitus, who was settling up a nefarious mining camp on Trunsky's land. It was in development by Core Design around 1993 and 1994, but information on the game is quite limited. From the one article I could find on the game, it was supposed to be a politically correct and ecological platformer, whatever that means. So far, all we have is one screenshot, and any other information on the game is most likely lost to time. Peaky Blinder is a cancelled side-scroller by Storm Sales Curve Interactive for the Game Gear, SNES, Mega Drive, Genesis, and Mega CD. The Mean Machine Sega magazine summarizes this best. Peaky Blinder is apparently a cult hero on the rave scene and features on loads of t-shirts. Such is his popularity, although we've never heard of him, that Storm has built him an entire identity and a ritzy storyline to accompany him. Peaky was born from a fusion of trash, mass media, toxic waste, and dumped video carts. Sounds pretty disgusting, which of course he is. But an inner Peaky yearns to break out of his foul exterior and live in a suburban house with frilly pink curtains and longs to be kind to animals. With this in mind, our whiffy hero sets out on this dire world's underground system and roams around the inner city slums where anything can happen, and usually does. Peaky's a bit unique in that he can change his physical form to suit and combat his hostile surroundings. There has to be some compensation for being a mutant scurfball from hell, we guess. End quote. I couldn't find any evidence of the game outside of this article. Based on the 1982 manga by Katsuhiro Otomo, it was in development by THQ for the Game Gear, Mega CD, Mega Drive, Genesis, and SNES. In an interview about the game's development, it seems that the game ended up forgotten when rights were transferred to THQ. People left the team, and other work soon became more important. All that's left is some screenshots and footage from a CES show in 1994. It was a racing game of sorts in development in the early 90s by an unknown company. News about the game went quiet until a ROM dump was found saying, Road Rash 2, conversion by Tech London LTD, programming by Alistar Mann, GFX Sean McClure, LGFX Fad SFX, Steve Morgan producer, Tony Love L, copyright 1991, 94 Electronic Arts, licensed to Time Warner L Interactive. Hi, editing Kate here. Um, I completely forgot to mention what video game this was converted into, and as far as I could figure it out, um, I think it's the Kawasaki Superbike Challenge. If I say that wrong, please let me know. Um, I don't know how I completely forgot to mention it, but I thought I'd just pop in for a second and tell you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Is it 
is a beat-em-up game by Rare and Cyrox Developments, and was one of the first games Rare developed for the SNES. A Game Gear release was set to happen in 1994, but then... radio silence. But what we did have was the potential for a good story. It revolved around the Battletoads visiting the Tibetan Gai Chong La Fortress to check out Sai Kaun Operation's virtual reality system known as Trips. The villain is a pig creature working under the Dark Queen and Silas Volkmeyer, and they kidnap the CEO's daughter along with the leader of the Battletoads, Zitz. The rest of the group decide to enter the virtual world to save their friends in the world they jumped into. The fact that the story was pretty fleshed out showed how far on development they were, and magazines even had copies for review. Any news of a release was still unknown though, until Tech Toy acquired the rights to the unfinished game, with missing music and minor glitches included. This didn't stop it from being released in Brazil, and that seems to be the only word we've heard about the release since then. But I'd highly recommend checking out the wiki on this game. I really enjoyed the story. Beethoven, the ultimate canine caper. It's a game based on the movie, yes, the movie about the St. Bernard, a movie I haven't thought about since I was a kid. Anyways, it was in development by Unexpected Development, golden company name by the way, and published under High Tech Expressions. Not much is known about the game other than a prototype box does exist, and the description on the back reads as follows. Everyone's favorite St. Bernard has now got a family of his own. But being proud papa to four little pups sounds a lot easier than it really is. Poor Beethoven's got his paws full. One minute the puppies are in the living room, the next, they're gone. Now you've got to help Beethoven find his kids before his sweetheart, Missy, discovers they're gone. Your search will take you all over town, through four worlds, with nothing but your keen sense of canine smell to sniff out your quarry. Filled with non-stop action, hilarious adventure, and wild surprises, Beethoven is one howling good time. A sequel to Bubsy and Claw's Encounter of the Third Kind is one of the few games on this list that did see a release in some form, thanks to Accolade in 1994. A Game Gear version was planned under the name Bubsy 2 Still No Pants, with a release date sometime of October of the same year. It's unknown why it went unreleased, but the declining popularity of the console was probably to blame. Captain Dynamo was developed by Codemasters and set to be released in 1994. I was able to find one screenshot of the game in a 1994 issue of Australia's Megazone, a description that reads as follows. Professor Austin Von Fleiswater has stolen a cache of diamonds and taken off to the moon. Captain Dynamo couldn't just sit by and let this happen. He's in hot pursuit, dodging traps and hordes of nasties in order to win back the loot for Lady Phyllis's Uppenhoofen. Build as a fun-filled platform puzzle game, play involves a lot of evasive action and scrambling to avoid conveyor belts, spiked wheels, water tanks, and rope slides. Not bad for a bloke in a dodgy costume. It was an entry into the Column series by Sega that did see a release for the Mega Drive in 93. A Game Gear port was shown at Winter CES 1994, but went quietly unreleased. is most well known as a top-down RPG for most IBM PC compatibles, but a port for Sega consoles was announced set for release in autumn of 1992. A long article for the game says this. Subtitled Dorovin's Key, Demon's Gate is the first in a role-playing series for the Game Gear. Features graphics that you don't normally associate with RPGs, i.e. good. You can control Captain Gustavus and his band of loyal followers. They are traveling the mythical content of El Siopia in search of a mystic. The strange person has a knowledge that can save Gustavus's homeland from the invasion of demons. All the normal elements of an RPG are included, traveling, communicating, and most importantly, fighting. You'll meet up with other people, some friends, some not, in your journey to the final challenge, a fight with the demon's leader. The control system is via illustrated menus, which are very easy to use and make the game simple to get used to. Good RPGs are few and far between on the Game Gear, the likes of Crystal Warriors and the forthcoming Fantasy Star being about it. When Demon's Gate finally hits the scene, things should start to change. As we mentioned, this is the first in a series of games, but this one took two years to develop. There's absolutely no way of predicting when the next in the series will come along. At the moment, there's tentative news to put Demon's Gate on the Master System. More news as we hear it. The Dinosaur Dually is a shoot-em-up by Dao Infosys. 
based on the South Korean manhwa Dooley, fittingly a dinosaur. It was released exclusively on the Master System in 1991, but a Game Gear port was announced. It's unknown what happened after that, and it disappeared quietly. I'm glad to see that we do have a playable version of the game, though. The sequel to Dragon's Fury is one of the many pinball games out there. It was known as Dragon's Fury 2 during development, but wound up changing later. The game was shown at Winter CES 1993, but while we have no word on what happened to the smaller version, one can play it on the Mega Drive. Fire and Ice was originally released for the Commodore Amiga, but was brought to the Master System in 1995. Plans were made to bring it to the Mega Drive and Game Gear, but that didn't happen. A review of it, however, can be found in a March 1994 issue of the Sega Power magazine, and it reads as follows. Suten, the evilest being in the galaxy, has somehow escaped a max security prison where he was held for 2,000 years. Now, after 12 light years of traveling, Suten has reached a small planet he had been planning to take over. What Mr. Sutan doesn't know is that his opponent Glem has picked up on his trail. You can see these characters represent the elemental forces of fire and ice. As Sutan recharges from the rays of the sun, Glem hires Cool Coyote to track him down. It seems that Cool Coyote is the only one who can recapture Sutan and recover the balance between the elements. But as you have guessed, Sutan won't cool off without a fight. Another pinball game for this list, it was in development by Williams Electronics Games. While it did release in some form, the Game Gear version was scrapped before it was nearly finished. We even got a Game Boy version in 95, and it's thought that the port is most similar to what we would have received. Image Tech Design and Game Tech teamed together to design The Humans. This entry had quite a bit of information to go around, telling me how dumb the characters are in this game, many probably too many times. It centers around a group of prehistoric homo sapiens who struggle to even wear clothes, and they need your help. They haven't even learned how to make tools, and they are in a struggle to battle evolutionary survival. Without the help of the player, they might go extinct. Both Game Gear and Mega CD versions were announced at Winter CES 1993, but wound up cancelled for unknown reasons. Izzy's Quest for the Olympic Rings is a platformer by Alexandria, based on the mascot for the 1996 Summer Olympics, Izzy. Enemies around the world have captured the Olympic Rings, and Izzy sets out to get them back. Set to release in May 1995, it never saw a release on any of the systems it was announced for. I can't help but think that the concept of the game is a tad insensitive, but I may just be overthinking it. It's a game probably no one has thought about in the past 20 years. A lone explorer named Arnie Sacknusson made a fantastic descent of the fabled lost kingdom of Atlantis at the Earth's core. After many centuries, his trail was discovered, first by me, Professor Oliver Lindenbrook, my niece Cindy, student Alec McEwen, our guide Lars, and his duck Gertrude. But we were not alone. In development by Sony ImageSoft, it was shown at both summer and winter CES of 1993. I was only able to find a GamePro article saying this about the game. Based on the cool TV show that takes place in 2000, this game sends you beneath the surface of the Earth to explore strange new worlds in action-adventure-style gameplay. Look for photorealistic graphics created via silicon models of actual TV sets. Labyrinth Stone is a pinball game that was in development by Game Arts. They are also responsible for the Grandia series. It was announced in 1991, but had disappeared from release schedules by July. I was able to find a Japanese magazine article talking about the game, and the only info I was able to get from it is that the reviewer was really excited about it and was going to feature Wizards and Monsters.
Maze Syndrome was one of the first games announced for the Game Gear when it made its debut at the Tokyo Toy Show in 1990. The only other info aside from one image is that it was set to release in December 1990. Known as Michael Jordan the Mad Professor Showdown during development, it was a platformer centered on the famous basketball store turned not so great actor. It was supposed to release during the third quarter of 1995, but any other info is unknown. sequel to NHL 95 and set to release on October 6th of 1995, it wound up cancelled for unknown reasons. It was intended to make your teeth sweat and had player animation unlike any other NHL game before it. Now, this entry had two separate games, but I didn't feel like splitting them up since they were both about golf. I'll start with PGA European Tour though, with the tagline, Tee Off on Your Sega Systems. It was supposed to be an exciting golf simulator by Polygames and published by everyone's favorite company, EA. It was supposed to release during the fourth quarter of 1995, but it went unreleased along with the other PGA game, PGA Tour Golf 3. A third in the Tour Golf series, it did see a release for the Mega Drive, while Game Gear, Super Nintendo, and Game Boy versions never materialized. Pinky was a game originally intended for the Amiga by Data Design Systems and published by Millennium Interactive for release in 1995. Tengen acquired the rights in 94 to see a release for the Game Gear, but that never happened. A Sega Magazine article from 1994 says this about Pinky. Coming soon from Tenjin, Pinky is something of a planet trotter, his mission being to collect the last remaining dinosaur eggs in the universe so that their race can be saved from extinction. Pinky will be released on Mega Drive and Game Gear in September, although at present, very little of the game is complete. Look out for a full preview in a couple of months. This game, centered around Vikings, was set to release in autumn of 92 from an unknown developer. This game never did see a release. A description from an August 1992 issue of the Sego Pro magazine sums up the game best. The Viking Child is a platform game featuring Brian, who one day comes home from his travels to find that his village has been destroyed by an evil wind. To add heartache, his family has been kidnapped. Now Brian, being a Viking, is going to get even with whatever caused this mess. It is revealed to Brian that he must travel to Valhalla to find the source of his anguish. During the eight levels, Brian will come up against untold numbers of adversaries, all with his demise in mind. Each level has a guardian who will have to be defeated to gain access to Valhalla. You'll have to use swords, potions, shields, and your very special viking battle skills to overcome the evil of Loki and his cronies. We have seen an early Game Gear version, and it's safe to say the speed of the game is breathtaking. I'm sorry to announce that this isn't one of the few solid Marvel films Thor Ragnarok. It's an unreleased Game Gear game. <laughs> Bad joke aside, I've got a long description to read from another magazine. Ragnarok is a board game based on an old Viking legend. Ragnarok was a time when all gods assembled to take part in a massive battle that brought about the end of the old world and the birth of the new. The Norse people played a game called King's Table based on this legend. The story is simple. Odin, a god, knows that Ragnarok is drawing near and isn't particularly looking forward to getting slaughtered. He designed a king's table with pieces designed to represent the various beings who be present at Ragnarok. The board he then takes down to Earth to test out his game strategies on humans, seeing as we are pretty devious and sneaky. The basic game is quite simple to learn, with mastering it takes many years. It is kind of a cross between chess and go. The board is set up with two opposing sides made up of different characters, each with different powers. Pieces are taken by surrounding them on a number of sides, 
how many depends on the power of the piece. There are a lot of opponents to take on, and ultimately you'll face Loki, another god who has the same idea as you. The board is shown in a 3D view with all the pieces highly detailed. There are animated sequences included to show just what your opponents think of your progress. You can go against the computer or head to head with a friend. Various options are available to make getting into the game a little simpler. Help, take back move, and replay all let you play around to make the most of your move. One outstanding feature is when pieces are about to be taken. A window pops open to show what kind of reaction that particular move would get at the real Ragnarok battle. These battle sequences are brilliantly animated and add an intense atmosphere to this deep game. Ragnarok has been converted from the PC game and has an imminent release. The Mega Drive hasn't had anything like this before. The only other board games on the horizon are Clue and Monopoly, with even chess not being represented at the moment. This should allow Ragnarok to sit at the top of the genre for quite a while to come. I was unable to find any other evidence of the game, no images or gameplay footage. Rampart is originally an arcade game for the Atari, but it was brought to Sega Systems in 1991, with a Game Gear port to be released in December of 1992. It's a strategy game I would compare to Balloon's Tower Defense. You build strong walls to defend your castle while also defending it from the knights trying to take them down. Players are given a short amount of time to protect it, but you get more firepower the more walls you put down. The only time you lose? When you fail to complete a full circle around your castle. Developed by Virgin Interactive, it was based on the film of the same name. A Game Gear version was shown at Winter CES 1992. It only saw release on the Game Boy and NES. Sequest DSV is based on the NBC TV show featuring a rather sophisticated submarine protecting a small community under the sea after most of the Earth's resources have been used up. Sounds exciting, right? It's a shame that it went unreleased. The graphics could have been really cool to see. Any info on the developer or release date is unknown. It's a beat-em-up game based on the Spider-Man universe. It was released for the Mega Drive in 1994, but Master System and Game Gear versions were announced. The story revolves around Cletus Cassidy, alter ego of Carnage, escaping from the Ravencroft Maximum Security Prison and then teams up with Shriek, Carrion, Demogoblin, and Doppelganger to wreak havoc in the city. Spider-Man gets wounded after meeting up with Shriek and Demogoblin, but is saved by Cloak and Dagger. Venom is who knows where when he hears about Carnage and decides to form a tentative alliance with Spider-Man to stop him. The story is narrated with comic panels, which honestly sounds awesome. The game is a single-player beat-em-up similar to Final Fight or Streets of Rage 3, and you can control both Spider-Man and Venom. Spider-Man is faster, while Venom hits harder. Power-ups are Small Heart, recovers 25% of health, Large Heart, fully recovers health, the Spider-Man or Venom symbol, an extra life, an exclamation mark, an extra continue. Your allies are Spider-Man, Fro college student Peter Parker, who gets the power of the spider after being bit, and his power hit is a rolling kick that can hit enemies in front and behind him. Venom, Eddie Brock, a former journalist with a burning hatred of Spider-Man. He believes Carnage is his responsibility to take care of. His power hit hits all enemies in a straight line. Black Cat, daughter of a cat burglar, had a fling with Spider-Man and decided to become vigilante to leave her sketchy past behind. She is not playable, but her hit is pounding on one enemy before cartwheeling away, which can damage nearby enemies. Cloak and Dagger, Tyrone Johnson and Tandy Bowen are New York runaways who were kidnapped by a pharmaceutical company, giving Tyrone the power to use darkness as a mode of transportation and weapon, and Tandy the ability to use light as projectile weapons. Cloak uses darkness to envelop the screen and damage enemies, Dagger uses light projectiles to hit enemies. Firestar, not the warrior cat, Actually mutant Angelica Jones, who can radiate microwave energy and is part of the new warriors. Her moves are using microwave blasts. Captain America, a military veteran named Steve Rogers. His power hit is swinging his shield across the screen, which damages all enemies around. Deathlock, aka Michael Collins, who underwent a cybernetic operation that made him a cyborg. His aide is firing his weapons across the screen and is helpful against hard to hit enemies. Iron Fist, or Danny Rand, who was lost in the Himalayan mountains. 
and learn the ancient ways of the warrior. He heals when Spider-Man calls him and will do a flying kick across the screen if Venom calls him. Morbius. It's Morbin time. Dr. Michael Morbius used an experimental serum to help his terminal illness, which turns him into a blood-craving vampire. When Spider-Man calls him, he sucks the life out of all the enemies on the ground. Venom calls, he flies across the screen, and stuns enemies. The enemies are Carnage, previously stated Cletus Cassidy, is a serial killer that was arrested and put in a maximum security prison. He is an extremely dangerous person and an extremely difficult villain in the game. Carnage does random attacks across the screen and has a stomp attack. Both this and his arms flailing around wildly take a large amount of health since he moves very fast and is hard to hit. The only known way to defeat him is to call for help, desperate attacks, or attack from behind. Shriek, Francis Barrison, was a drug dealer who was now obsessed with having a family of her own. In combat, she uses long-range energy bolts and can be hard to hit. Doppelganger, an evil version of Spider-Man and initially Demo Goblin's partner, is seen as a six-armed clone of Spider-Man. Doppelganger has multiple hard-to-hit attacks. They can randomly fire web shooters to grab you and hit you, and if he crouches, he can attack you. Demo Goblin, a possessed version of Hobgoblin's Jason Masondale, is a religious fanatic, usually found flying around with a demon, can break punch combos, and can throw pumpkin bombs while flying around. Carrion, scientist Malcolm McBride, gets a virus from Miles Warren and is drowned to the group after being defeated by Spider-Man multiple times. He's capable of flying around and draining life from allies, and is usually accompanying the Carnage team more of a nuisance than a real enemy in the game. The game was probably known best for being one of the rarest Mega Drive games, being sold for $64.99 on Amazon. Street Racer is a racing game developed by Vivid Image and published by Ubisoft. A Mega Drive version was released in Brazil and Europe, but the Game Gear and 32X versions never saw the light of day. It's most comparable to Super Mario Kart, racing around a track littered with obstacles and helpful items. Set to release in November of 1995, it has been lost to time and never got the opportunity to show whether it could stand up to the game that inspired it. An unlicensed platform game by OpenCorp for the Master System, it was released exclusively in South Korea. Total War 3 is infamous for stealing graphics from Super Mario, and some enemies resemble Tiki from the New Zealand story. The US version for the Game Gear was going to be called Cave Dude by Innovation. It showed at Winter CES 1992, but wound up cancelled. I couldn't find out whether this one is based on the 1993 movie or the 1987 children's book, but it's an unreleased action platformer from an unknown developer and published by High Tech Expressions. A prototype photo does exist from a Sega forum site, and that's it. No other information. There is a brief history of Sega and a list of the lost games for the Game Gear. I want to thank Sega Retro and Unseen64 for the info I used to make this video, as researching this took many hours, but I think it was worth it. 33 games got announced and some were near completion and then just lost. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this entry into my new series that doesn't have a name yet, talking about lost games for video game consoles. Let me know your thoughts down below and what you want to see next, and leave a like and subscribe, but only if you want to. No judgment here. But I'll leave it at that. I hope you all have a fantastic day.